Let's demystify the difficult topic from specialist management accounting techniques, which is throughput accounting. And the way we're going to do this, we're going to look at a really simple business example to boil the topic down to its basics. Let's imagine I have a bakery producing and selling cookies. And I follow the principles of modern manufacturing, so I am just in time. I only produce a batch of cookies when I receive an order from the supermarket. Now, this funny looking device is my oven. I have an old fashioned oven and the oven can only hold one tray of cookies at a time. One tray fits in the oven. I have an unlimited supply of trays. I've got a storage room full of trays, but I can only bake one tray at a time and one tray holds 10 cookies. And this is a complication we often see in the PM questions working in batches, right? So in one batch of cookies, I can, one batch produces 10 units, 10 cookies. Let's look at my production process. The first thing that I do is mix up the cookie dough. The next thing that I do after I've mixed the cookie dough is I set up the trays. I put 10 lumps of cookie dough on each tray. After that, I begin the baking. And when I'm all done, I package. Yes, I recognize that's a simplified version of the process. Of, co of course, the cookies need to cool before I can package them, but let's go with this. Now, if I assign a time per stage, let's pretend the mixing takes two minutes, setup takes two minutes, baking takes five minutes, packaging takes one minute. So we can visualize that now with some color, can't we? It's not to perfect scale, it's just something like this. So we can now recognize that one batch of cookies takes 10 minutes. And I now have a business problem. My demand exceeds my capacity to produce. So I would like to recognize which stage of production is the bottleneck. Bottleneck means that's the process which limits my output. Can you recognize that right here? Well, I think you can. First thing we do is we mix. Then we hand off to setup. Then once setup is done, I start baking. When baking is done, I can start packaging. Now, while the first batch is in the oven, I could start mixing a second batch, couldn't I? Because I have multiple trays. So I could start doing this one and this one. And now I recognize I, I might have a little bit of idle time here. I've mixed and set up the next batch. That only took me four minutes, but as soon as batch number one comes out of the oven, I'm gonna pop batch number two right in. And even if I am not an ACCA qualified accountant, even the baker, he's gonna understand to maximize his production, he wants to keep the oven as busy as possible because it's the oven that's limiting his output. He could mix faster, couldn't he? He could mix all the batter in the morning, in theory. He could hire another guy to just mix batter, hire another person to set up, but the oven only holds one tray. So if we want to make more cookies, the only thing we could do would potentially be to bake faster, removing, reducing the time on the bottleneck. The other thing we could do is buy another oven, but that becomes a financial management decision, investment appraisal, and that's not the problem at hand right now. So team, first thing that we need to recognize when we are 
following the principles of throughput accounting is the theory of constraints. And that says, in order to maximize output, we're going to need to identify the bottleneck resource. That's the resource that limits our output. And we got to focus on this one. So if we can improve time per unit on the bottleneck, we will improve the output. And if we're following modern manufacturing, that means everything we make, we can sell. That will increase my throughput contribution and my cash flow. Now that we are up to speed on the idea of the bottleneck, let's review contribution and look at how throughput accounting uses a different concept of contribution. Contribution, as you should remember, is the selling price minus the variable costs. So price minus variable costs equals contribution. In other words, we earn the revenue from selling something, but we have to peel some of that off, some of the cash off of the sales price to cover the variable cost. So what's left over is the contribution to the fixed costs and profit. So it's what's left over after we've covered the variable cost. Now, in quote unquote traditional terms, let's use a T for traditional. If you remember from MA, we would take our selling price, which is P, and we would subtract our variable costs, which were usually direct materials, M, direct labor, and we would have our concept of contribution. Now, if we subscribe to the principles of throughput accounting, we're going to modify that concept. So we're going to call this throughput contribution. We're going to start with the selling price once again the revenue earned from selling one unit. I will subtract from that my direct materials. Now, traditionally, we would put labor next, wouldn't we? However, look at this. Yes, we pay the workers by the hour. So in theory, they work more we pay more, that's variable. But if we come back to our situation above, our cookie factory, our workers come to work eight hours a day, five days a week. If we could somehow magically bake the cookies faster, imagine we put the temperature up and we could bake them faster. Now there's more risk of them burning, right? If we leave them in the oven just a moment too long, they'll burn. But if we put the time to 4.5 minutes per batch, we will make more cookies, won't we? If we make more cookies, we will consume more cookie dough. And cookie dough is the direct material. But the workers still came to work for eight hours, five days a week. So if we turn up the speed on the, on the oven, we make more cookies, we consume more dough, cookie dough, but we don't pay more for labor. So team, under throughput contribution, we assume that the labor is fixed. So the throughput contribution per unit is going to be price minus direct materials. Throughput contribution, TPC. Very important principle that you need to grasp in order to keep moving with this difficult topic, throughput accounting. At this point, we've reviewed the concept of the bottleneck, the stage in production that limits our output. We've looked at throughput contribution, which is calculated by subtracting the direct material cost per unit from the price. So price minus direct materials equals throughput contribution. Now we can look at the throughput accounting ratio.
The throughput accounting ratio is a tool that lets us evaluate either our products or a business unit, and we're evaluating the relative profitability of that product or business unit. And it works like this. We need to understand the throughput contribution. And the throughput contribution that we already discussed was the selling price minus M for direct materials. That is throughput contribution. But I want to recognize throughput contribution per hour on the bottleneck resource. So for our imaginary bakery ab above, we would work in batches because we're producing in batches of 10 and we would earn the revenue from selling 10 cookies minus the direct material costs of producing those 10 cookies divided by five minutes and we would get the contribution per minute. Then we would divide that by the other factory costs. That would be everything else. It would be the overheads, the electricity for running the oven, right? That would be the variable overhead, but we are running the oven eight hours a day, five days a week. So we can assume that's fixed plus the labor. So the other factory costs would be all the overheads plus the direct labor. Direct labor in traditional terms would be in the contribution calculation. Here we're assuming it fixed. Divided by the total bottleneck hours in the time period, in the year, the week, or the month. And the context of the question would let you know what time period you should work in. Now, this is going to give us a result. And if the result is 2 over 1, that would be good news. That's telling us, let's imagine it's also dollars. So for every hour, we are earning $2 after we pay for the direct materials. That's $2 per hour earned, and it's costing me $1 per hour to run that factory. So look at that. If it's 2 over 1, it's greater than 1. That's good news. That shows that it's profitable. However, if we had 1 over 2, now we are earning $1 per hour after we cover our direct materials. However, the factory costs $2 per hour to run, including paying for the workers. So that one is gonna be loss making. So PM team, that is the tricky part of throughput accounting, getting to this throughput accounting ratio. And I just took you through the mechanics of it. At this point, I'd like you to go back into your notes, whatever notes, whatever study notes you are using. Try it again. It should make more sense this time. All of the study notes have a throughput accounting ratio activity. So try that activity again. You've got to find six things. You've got to find a selling price. You've got to find direct materials, You've got to find the time on the bottleneck resource, not the total time of production, but just the time on the bottleneck. In our example, it was that oven, five minutes. Then you're going to find the overheads in the time period, let's say it's a week, the labor cost in that same week, and then the hours of bottleneck time in that week. So we have one oven in our bakery if we're opened 40 hours a week. There you go. That would be the hours per week. We could also do it in minutes. Once you have those six figures, you can calculate the throughput accounting ratio.